Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. If you have your Bibles, if you could turn to 1 John chapter 2. If not, get it on your phone. That'd be awesome. All right, here's the word this morning. Beloved, chapter, uh, verse two, chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Other way. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Thanks, Rach. We've been tracking through First John, right alongside of you guys in Tulare. I listened to Glenn's message from last week and was really wishing he would have in Tulare teaching instead of me. He did a fantastic job last week. So he, te- he taught on First John 2, 1 to 6, and I just wanted to quickly just exhort you, Radiant Visalia, you are blessed with wonderful teachers, wonderful preachers, godly fathers and mothers in the faith. Do not take for granted where you're planted and who is leading you right now. It's good. The Apostle John is a good papa in the faith, and he is also an OG disciple and apostle of Jesus Christ. He's also a really good teacher, and so he's been exhorting like a father through this text, and he's also reminding us like a good teacher. That's what good teachers do. They remind over and over and over and over again because we forget over and over and over and over again. This is just part of the joy of being human. Good teachers remind us what we've learned. And then good teachers also give us tests, not to cause anxiety or to be cruel like some students may think. It's actually to help us Help us know what we know. Help us weed out wonky thoughts and wonky beliefs and wonky standing where we're getting off slightly. Give us tests. John's a good teacher giving us tests to really sift through and know what we believe. Professor Power summed up the test given in 1 John as these three things, doctrine, obedience, and love. Do you believe Jesus is who he says he is? Is your doctrine straight and secure? Do you believe what the word says about God, not the word on the street? Do you obey him? Do you actually do what Jesus commands? This is what last week's text was talking about. And do you love? Is this supreme for you? Is this what's paramount? Do you sincerely love God? Do you sincerely love others around you? Today's test is a love test, and it's one of many that John gives in 1 John. Last week was a a vertical love test. 
your love for God, my love for God, which leads to obedience. This is what Jesus said in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love Jesus, you're going to do what Jesus says. This is how vertical love translates, is that we walk out whatever Jesus says. So this week we're moving from our vertical love and obedience to our horizontal brotherly love. John's coming to check the tires on your love for the people around you right now. First John 2, 7 through 8, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. The old command is the message that you've heard. What's interesting is John doesn't actually come out and say exactly what commandment he's talking about. But if you look closely, all signs are pointing to the brotherly love commandment given by Jesus. He gave this in John chapter 13, 34. He's sitting down with his disciples before he goes to the cross, and he says this, a new command I give you. Sound familiar? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is the new old-fashioned way right here. This is what John is getting to, I believe. This is what he's referring to in chapter 2 here. In fact, the call for brotherly love goes back even further than that gospel account of that night around the dinner table. John, 1 John chapter 3, if you just skip ahead a little bit, he mentions this again. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, verses 11 and 12. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. As old as the first sons of earth, we are taught and it's expected that we would love our brothers. We would not hate them or do evil towards them. The old side of this commandment is that love and unity is actually expected between brothers, and it's always been a part of God's heart. It's always been a part of God's culture and His outlook and His plan for us as His people, as old as this earth almost. The new side of this command is Jesus. Jesus is the new side of this. He says in John 13, 34, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. The new part of this is that we have a role model. We have some footsteps to follow. We know what it looks like to be human and love other stinking humans. You know, those humans that you're sitting close by. You know, the ones that cut you off when you're driving. You know, the ones who don't vote like you. You know, the ones who you unfriended last year. You know, those people. Jesus gives us an example of what to do with loving others. Douglas O'Donnell says this, Jesus' message was exclusive, but his love was inclusive. The message Jesus preached, although it's not really popular, was extremely exclusive. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Extremely exclusive. Mildly to majorly offensive. However, the love that Jesus lived in this life was totally inclusive. He loved everyone. He loved everyone. He loved his closest disciples. John 13, it wasn't like he was just putting up with them. He loved them. He loved his friends, so he had his circle, you know, of inner friends, those that were following. Then he had his other friends, you know, that live in like Visalia, not Tulare. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and it says that they, he loved them, John 11. Jesus even loved people who rejected him, like the rich young ruler. He asked the question, what do I need to do? Oh, here's what you need to do, and he says, nah, it's too much for me. 
and he leaves. And what does the scripture say? Jesus' heart is filled with what? Not disdain, not disgust, not a heavy eye roll. His heart is filled with love. Oh, if you just knew the love that I have for you. Jesus loved his mom. Yeah. On the cross, he takes some of his dying breath to make sure his mama is taken care of. John chapter 19. Who is it that's put in charge to make sure she's taken care of? John, the apostle of love. The supreme demonstration of the love that Jesus showed and what he calls us to is actually there on the cross. When he's dying for us, his enemies. Romans 5, 6 to 8, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is our standard for loving others. There's no greater example for us to look to. I don't care what podcast you listen to. I don't care who you follow. I don't care what books you're reading. Jesus is supreme. We're just riffing off of everything he did, every word that he said, every action that he took towards people. We want desperately to be like him. He's our role model. Not only is he our role model, but praise God, he's the source of this love that we actually now can live out. This is what it says, right? Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you, both to will woo, and to work for his good pleasure. Monday morning comes, you don't want to love the people you're about to see at work. Guess what? Knock, knock, knock. Holy Spirit here. I can help you with that will. I can help you with those actions today. You don't just have to be, you know, whatever personality type you are today. We could tandem bicycle this thing together. I'm here, baby. I'm here. If you're a true follower of Jesus, this is what John's writing for, that we would know, right? We'd have blessed assurance. You will love God, and you'll do what he commands, and what he commands us to do is love each other, just like he loved us. The Holy Spirit is hard at work today in the world, here and all around the globe. And what he's doing, John 15 tells us, is he's testifying to the world that Jesus is who he said he is. This is what he's doing right now. He's affirming and confirming, saying, yes, he is who he says he is. Simultaneously, the Holy Spirit is also pointing the world's attention to the church and saying, you want to know what it looks like to live out and live in the goodness of this love? Look to the church. This is your best example that you have. This is what John said, John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Why? If you love one another. So that's the question for us this morning. Radiant, Visalia, how you doing with this? How's it going here? You all right? Everybody feeling the love? There are about 59 one another passages in the Bible. And, and these are each one practical expressions of Christ-like love and devotion that he calls us to have with one another. There's a few that will be up on the screen, but there's also, a, I think, a QR code that will be up there. And you can take a little dip, dip picture of that thing. And it'll take you to a full list on our website. But listen to a few of these. This isn't some generic love. This isn't some kind of Hallmark card. This is the type of love that he's commanding us to have. Be devoted to one another. Romans 12, honor one another above yourselves. Build up one another. Serve one another. Galatians 5.13, bear one another's burdens. 
pick up the heavy stuff that people are carrying. Galatians 6, 2, forgive one another. This is the love that Christ shows us day in and day out. It's not generic, it's specific, and it's extremely costly. This will cost you everything. It is one of the truest tests for us if we know Christ, that we would love one another like this, just like he did. 1 John 2, 8 tells us that this brother love is true in him. It's true in Jesus, and it's true in you. This, is, this you that's used here is actually a plural word, not an individual. Brotherly love cannot just exist in you alone. This only exists in the community of Christ. Right here. Because the darkness is passing away, praise God, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Some of us are stumbling around right now in this season of life that we're in. And I believe because it's because we're so fixated on ourselves, on our own personal calling, on me. What do I do? What are my gifts? What am I supposed to make an impact with? Me, 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 me. And we totally miss that predominantly what the Bible tells us is we is more important than me. And we might be stumbling right now because we're so fixated on us that we miss and we're blinded and we're deceived because we can't see we were designed by God to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. There's a liberation that Jesus has for us, and it's in us dying to ourselves, preferring one another. You, when you obey Christ and you love the ones around you that he's specifically planted you next to, you didn't accidentally get knit into a family here. You said yes, and he's got specific plans for you here in this community to become more like him. Not just to be a nicer person, but to be more like him so that his love would be manifest here in Visalia. His love would be manifest here in Tulare County. John says it's so black and white, it's like living in darkness or living in the light. You can absolutely tell the difference here. If you're a true follower of Christ, you will not live in the darkness of hate, but you'll live in the light of love. So this is the question. Are you living contrary to what we know love is? 1 Corinthians 13, right? You've been to weddings before. You know what kind of love Christ calls us to, and it's way more than just our individual marriages. He's calling us to this kind of love that we see, but are you living counter to that? Is there any ounce of this in you? Are you envious of the people you're sitting next to? Are you arrogant? Are you rude? Are you resentful? Do you secretly or publicly rejoice when one of your brothers or sisters stumbles because it makes you look a little bit better? You can just kind of, oh, yeah, we're all human. Do you insist that you get your own way around here? Is there any ounce of these shadows in your posture towards each other here in this family? Or are you living in the goodness of the light of 1 Corinthians? Are you patient with the people you're sitting next to? Are you kind? Is it easy to rejoice when others get something and you don't? Is it something that you do regularly considering other people more important than yourselves? Do you honor the smallest and the weakest here? 
Do you honor the strongest and the mightiest among you? Are you quick to forgive? Are you quick to believe the best of the people that you're sitting next to? Are you living in the light? G Jesus and John here are pulling no, no punches for us. It's not enough to say that you love God. It's not enough to say that you love each other. I love my church family. I love it around here. If you don't love like Jesus loved, then you're fooling yourself. And you're living a shadow life. And I bet it haunts you. Love isn't a sentimental statement. It is a life that is sacrificed for others' good. This is it. This is our standard. It's not that you would write a good little card for Pastor Appreciation Month. It's that you would die for the most annoying person in the room. John, the great teacher, is dishing out some weighty tests here because it's a weighty call. And he's not done yet, so good news. We're just getting started here. He's going to come back to this one over and over again. But as you listen, as you hear these words, it is very easy to start to feel a little discouraged, like, Good golly, who is it that does these? Only people who get paychecks? Like, who could do this stuff day in and day out? Honestly, am I even a real Christian? Like, I had that thought multiple times reading through 1 John. So if you did as well, like, don't feel bad. You're, we're in the same boat, baby. Is this real? Jesus, is this really happening here inside? John, I think, knows because he's a good teacher, but he's also a good father. And he knows the soberness of this truth that he's proclaiming. And I think this is where the next two verses shine. He, he takes this almost like kind of pivot in verses 12 and 14. And he gives this beautiful pastoral exhortation. You could just feel his papa heart coming out. And it comes in almost like a song or a poem form here. He sings these truths over a weary church. Are you weary? Are you tired of doing good? Are you tired of doing what you were called to do and it seems like it's working for everybody else but you? Are you exhausted by what's happening in and around you in this world right now? Are you tired Radiant, Visalia, do you have a little ache in your bone? Is your posture a little hunched over because of this? Receive this song sung over you by John. In fact, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but why don't you stand? And I'm going to sing this over us this morning. This may not happen next service. Just receive the voice of the Father who sees you. He knows the season of life you're in. He knows what you're carrying, what you're walking through. He, he put it in your hands. And he says, I am writing you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing you, fathers and mothers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I am writing you, young men and women, because you have overcome the evil one. 
And I am writing you, little children, because you know the Father. And I am writing you, fathers and mothers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I am writing you, young men and women, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Thank you, Lord. John, you can, you can sit. I'm going to quickly try to unpack these these three areas here, because I think that John's writing to these three groups, little children, fathers, and mothers, and there's a lot of wondering kind of, is this like specific to ages? Is this specific to gender? Is this more like a in general, as you walk with Jesus kind of thing? And what I believe matters greatly in this moment when John's writing is that this is true about the Christian life. If you're here and you're a Christian, if you're in Christ these are true for you. And he's saying, please fix your eyes on this. Please know this is true. Receive this. Your sins are forgiven. Sin can be overcome. And we get to know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven. This has to be crystal clear for you as you walk out of here this morning. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the Christian's not a person who is seeking forgiveness or who is hoping to be forgiven. The Christian's not a person who is uncertain about forgiveness or who prays for it or tries to merit it. No, Christians are people who know that they are forgiven. We still repent. We still ask for forgiveness. In fact, we do it quicker than anybody else in the world because we know what's on the other side. We know if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We know this is true. So when you walk out of here and you have these thoughts, well, am I forgiven? Was that covered? Don't you dare play games with, I hope so. I'm going to work towards that. No, absolutely not. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. This is why we have confidence. Not because we're fumbling forward, but because his name's sake. Not our own merit or doing. Not some general love that God has. It's just kind of obligatory towards us because he just signed up for it. No, we have certainty because the all-sufficient, perfect, finished work of Jesus on the cross is for us. And when he said, it is finished, it is finished. Young Christians, you've overcome the evil one. You're strong. The word abides in you. Those of you who have been walking with Jesus for a little bit of time now. You know you're doing that hand in hand through a war zone with Jesus. You're very aware. What, what Peter says in 1 Peter 5 eight: be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Maybe you've gotten nipped by this lion. Maybe you're terrified of his roar. Maybe his teeth are in you right now. We're at war, but the victory is won. This is the truth. He says, you have overcome. Not someday. There is an immediate victory when we put our faith in Jesus. It's not complete yet. The enemy troops are still scorching the earth on their way down. But it is true and it is sure as the sun rises, the kingdom of God stands forever. You, dear children, are from God. 
and have overcome them because the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Christ has given us his spirit. We are not in this alone. This is not like a pep rally where it's like, yeah, all right, we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We have the living God inside of us who raised Christ from the dead, now is in you, at work. We are not alone. We have the imperishable seed of God's word in us. It doesn't expire. It doesn't go sour. John writes to fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. This is the true mark of a good and healthy and meaningful relationship, period, is that you know this person, and this person knows you. This is it. You don't just know facts about a person. You know facets about a person because it's so intricate. And you only get to know that when you walk with them continuously, side by side, for a long distance, with ups and with downs, with these joyful highs and joy-filled moments, and then also these gut-wrenching moments. This is where you get to know someone. Fathers and mothers know God because you've walked with Him in every season. There is a steadiness and a faithfulness. You can hear it when you worship and you hear Larry declaring, yes, yes, yes. Mature Christians know God is who he says he is, not who we've made it up in our minds. God told us in Exodus 34 who he is what he's like. And this is what fathers and mothers in the faith cling to. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We know who he is. We don't just answer like Bible trivia questions. This is what the church is built on right here. This is what Jesus told Peter. I'm going to build my truth on this church. Not Peter. He's going to build it on the confession that Jesus is who he says he is. He's not building the church on trends that kind of shift with each generation or our preferences because he wants us to be comfortable. That's not what he's building here. He's building on the truth that he is the way, he is the life, he is the truth. We're not fixated on programs. What's going to best serve here? I don't know. I don't know. We got a new screen, but what's next? The world's progressing. Come on, we got to keep up. We got to move. What's going on here? No, 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 no. Slow down. Slow down. Listen to the fathers and the mothers. They've seen this go round and round and round. And there's a steadiness in them because they have tasted and seen the steady love of God in their life. You're at a stage now, some of you, where what matters more than gifts is the gift giver. What matters more than your calling is that God actually called you. What matters more than your seat at the table and where is it and who am I next to is that his table is being filled with his children. This is so much like a father and a mother. Like, I don't, I don't care if you bring a gift. I just really need you home for the holidays. I, I don't care what the test result says, as long as you're with me, Lord, I will go forward. I don't care what the world says about me and about you. If you make good on your word and walk with me through this shadow, the valley of death, I'm going to be okay. Whatever season of life you're in with Jesus, these are true for you. You must know them. Your sins are forgiven. You actually have the power within you to overcome the sin that's face to face with you every day. 
and we get to know Him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Though I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave divide